So welcome everyone to the Old Bank's New Ambitions panel. Uh, today, I'm joined by Julia Holsgrieve, Paul Fremantle, Carmela Gomez, and Martin Slatty. If I could have everyone please introduce themselves uh, and tell us where you come from and how you relate to open banking. Carmela? Hello to everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you. Uh, I've been working in banking for the last 25 years. Uh, and I did everything in banking from trading to set up uh, an online bank. I dealt with uh, the venture capital uh, side of the bank. And uh, I recently ended in, in open banking after working with several global projects across the bank related to electronic channels and different payment systems. So I think this is an amazing challenge to uh, go forward. Thank you, Carmela. Julia? I am Julia. I work for Keen Innovation, which is a subsidiary of Basel Cantonal Bank in Switzerland. Um, we have two banks in the group, so Bank Claire and Basel Cantonal Bank. And we're basically their innovation lab. So we, um, we work on all kinds of partnership or we, we, we develop our own solutions. And uh, why I'm here at the moment is um, basically because I'm focused on uh, banking as a service, uh, building up that um, new business line in the bank and um, kind of working on different use cases for invisible banking, banking as a service, and so on. Thank you, Julia. Paul? Hi, I'm the Chief Technology Officer and co-founder of a company called WSO2. And I and, and the company come to open banking actually from the API side of the world rather than from the banking side of the world. So I, um, we started doing APIs uh, pretty much 13 years ago when we uh, helped eBay implement the gateway for all their API traffic and, and very quickly we're up to billions of transactions a day and since then we've developed we've created hundreds of customers help them build out their API management strategies and what we've seen of course is that uh, a number of banks have really wanted that technology not only in open banking but actually uh, non-compliant APIs are very, very important as well in the industry and actually finance as a whole is our biggest sector. So thank you. Yeah, welcome, Paul. Great stuff. Martin? Hello, I'm Martin Sladeček, coming from Commercial Banka, which is the member of Societe General Group. Uh, I, I hope familiar to you. Uh, actually, Commercial Banka is a full service bank uh, operating in Czech Republic, covering all client segments uh, you know. And uh, what uh, I'm proud of, uh, this is the, on one side, the traditional bank, but on the other side, not the old fashioned one, because uh, they uh, realized several years ago, uh, meaning the top management of the bank, uh, to act proactively. Uh, meaning uh, the challenge of uh, PSD2 and APIs. And uh, so, so, so I joined Commercial Banka because uh, before that time, I was all the time acting as uh, on a vendor side as, as the advisor and consultant. And uh, we have built together open banking from the scratch. And uh, actually we are perceived as leaders on a chip market and not only on that. So uh, this is our situation. And uh, I can confirm that open banking is worth of investment. And we have uh, already uh, numbers which are showing uh, and proving uh, that case. So, hello. Welcome, Martin. And my name is Carlos Figueredo. I am the CEO of Open Vector. But most importantly, I was the head of data standards for the open banking implementation entity. So uh, pretty much one of the, I guess, co-founders of the open banking initiative in the UK. As part of Open Vector, we are a consultancy firm, an advisory firm that primarily helps governments, financial institutions, and uh, 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 fintechs to be able to onboard and uh, evangelize on the subject of open banking. Uh, we've been uh, very uh, much uh, involved not only with the UK Open Banking Initiative, but also across uh, the Americas, primarily in Mexico, where we helped the, uh, the Mexican government with the fintech law and the first data standards for open banking in the Americas. So I'll be your chair for today, and here goes the first question. So for the first question today, it goes to Carmela. 
Carmela, various banks have led on the subject of open banking, but what have they done to break from the image of a traditional bank to bank, a bank to a bank that, has, that is open to collaborative innovation? Uh, it's a good question. I mean, open banking seeks to provide customers with uh, a more efficient and personalized services. And uh, it also offers the opportunity to innovate, streamlining processes, creating new business models, and opening new markets. To develop an open banking strategy means focusing on the end customer experience. And what has changed in the user behaviors? In the past, users visited the bank, while now they expect to be uh, the one, to be the bank, the one that approaches the customers, offering everything they need, whenever they need it, wherever they need it. And uh, this implies some changes, because to reach new customers, you need to offer financial solutions on other platforms and not always related to bank environments. So, with open banking, both individual and companies will have better options to decide where to find all they need. A good example of this is how BBVA has addressed their customer app, um, where we solve a real need, creating an excellent customer experience by offering um, data from customer accounts or cards coming from different entities in a single uh, application. So the customer can access one single entry point to deal with all their information. And they, obviously this has transformed not only the way in which customers see banks, but also the bank internal structure. Um, at BBVA, for example, we see uh, open banking as a strategic opportunity to provide better digital experience to people, but also help uh, both companies and, and our own organization with their, the digital transformation process that is needed for this. In fact, I mean, our mantra is to get closer to the innovation ecosystem and explore new business models. Um, and open banking offers us a path for growth, either by improving our distribution network, um, but it also allows to, to reach new clients and, and businesses in their own ecosystem. Um, it also provides us the possibility to add third party services to our platform, which makes our services more appealing or maybe increase our processes efficiency, efficiency no? So uh, what do we do to achieve this? We use strategic partnerships as we have uh, successfully done, for example, with Uber in, in Mexico, mm -hmm. which uh, has turned BBVA into the first bank to offer its product on a third party platform in Mexico. Here, uh, I mean, the solution is mainly BBVA APIs provide drivers access to, to real time in time payment functions and debit card operations from, from the Uber app directly. This collaboration with other companies and sectors allows uh, weaving networks with partners to create new experiences and also to participate in ecosystems that can add a high value to both the bank and its customers. No? So I, I think this is the main change around the partnerships and how we transform the way to offer those services to, to our customers. Well, thank you very much, Carmela. Um, Julia, would you like to comment? Yeah, I, um, <laughs> no, there was a lot. Um, I think I, I completely agree. I think this the mindset shift and this kind of ecosystem approach of kind of doing more together instead of just focusing on your own products. Um, I think that's that's the main change that's that's currently happening i mean i live in switzerland where we don't have psd2 and it's all not that um regulated yet but there's still kind of the need to to think more in terms of ecosystems and and yeah develop new models of working together and i think that's really interesting to to watch right now thank you for that paul yeah there's definitely uh, some really interesting shifts going on uh, and one of the things I've really noticed is that uh, a lot of developing countries have really started to not not sort of not be required, not be have to worry about compliance, but they're actually becoming very proactive about uh, creating open banking standards and, and doing that. And that's because they've been a hotbed of innovation. I mean, we 
a few years ago built a mobile wallet for a large uh, telco provider in in Kenya and now we see Kenyan banks really keen to implement open banking and build new apps and and as as Carmela says really participate in an ecosystem and I think that that's a key word here very very true Martin would you like to comment on that question Actually, uh, I, I saw that case uh, with Uber and BBVA uh, recently, uh, and uh, I have to say this is typical example of how things uh, could work. And uh, not only combining uh, fintech banking uh, together, but to do as well as some responsible steps, because uh, this is how you can cover unbanked uh, population. So uh, you can do as well as not, not only reasonable things, but as well as good things together, and in some innovative way. And this is what gives me sense. Okay, so thank you, Martin, for that. For the next question then, Julia, based on your background and that of your firm, which are the heart of FinTech innovation, how are you finding it to work with banks in today's fast moving world like open banking? Uh, I think, yeah, so there are several layers. I mean, firstly, we're not in Europe or in the PSD2 world. So it's, it, Switzerland is a bit kind of more hesitant at the moment to to um, yeah work on it on a regulatory side, so it's more driven by the by the banks and other players themselves. There's about three different initiatives at the moment that really try to to push standards and to rally groups around them to to, um, to drive the topic. Um, but at the moment, it's still mostly driven by more one-to-one -one partnerships. So APIs between um, a bank and a, a digital platform or a bank and a fintech. Um, and those, those cases are becoming more, more common. Um, and then that's, that's kind of, yeah, that's the risk that at the moment that lots of things happen without the standards. And then, um, yeah, it will be maybe maybe there will be some change required when that, when that, that changes in the future. Um, yeah, but I think the mindset of the banks is, is really interesting at the moment to, to realize that, for instance, with banking as a service, that they can develop a whole new business model where possibly they're not even visible, where they're in the background of empowering something, which is so against what, what has always been the, the driving force for the the customer interface always was the most important thing for banks and um, realizing that that customer interface might be actually better served by someone else that has a different relationship to the to the client that maybe has a better ux or has a may already existing relationship through through another industry um, from e-commerce or other other industries um, that's that's something that's slowly kind of changing and it, it's really interesting to watch at the moment so, yeah thank you julia for that carmela do you have an opinion um in fact i think you touched a very important point which is the standards issue um <clears throat> creating those standards will definitely mean a change in the way that companies partners banks every single player across the ecosystem in open banking will work. And that's, I think, one of the key points that will make the market explode and they will, will definitely change the way we do things. Now we have plenty of examples across history, regardless if you take autos, regardless if you take printers, if you take video, whatever, the standards have always help the industry to grow really fast uh, once the standard has uh, been set up. And I think that in open banking, that's critical. In fact, there is a European Banking Association consultation going on now or starting uh, that will probably take us towards new standards. And the sooner the better we, we set that up, the, the, the sooner we'll see the, the market growing. Coming from from the background of standards, I cannot agree more and, and really hope that we continue in that, in that path. Uh, but also not only of just um, of, of creating standards, but ensuring that we are all using the same standard. Uh, so I think that that's an important point. Paul? So certainly I've seen some 
very different behaviors from banks uh, over the past couple of years driven by open banking. And I think it's really interesting. I've seen firstly some very large banks uh, that, that were traditionally, let's say, a little slow to act, uh, really kind of start to ramp up their innovation and their agility. And some of them have been doing it by setting up kind of uh, subsidiaries that are much freer to move. Uh, some of them are trying to reorganize their, their internal structures. And some of them are doing it in different geographies, for example, by, by being very agile in, in non-traditional markets. Uh, and also I've seen some, you know, small banks just uh, really ramp up their speed of, of operation just to meet the compliance deadline. I mean, we worked with a, a small UK bank called Synergy and, and they were late to the table. Uh, they, they were not, they were not going to be ready for the compliance deadline. About six months before the deadline, they came to us and we did the whole thing in three months and got in production and they actually beat the deadline. So that's not normal behavior for a bank. So that was fun to do. It was an interesting project. Thank you for that. Martin, do you have any comment on that? Actually, I can just add to that standards are really crucial. Uh, Actually, for example, uh, we have a movement on the Czech market, uh, which is sector uh, led uh, by the Czech Banking Association in creation of the Czech National uh, Bank Identity Scheme and uh, creation of the common standard, which will allow all uh, banks, uh, all service providers, so meaning all market players to connect uh, together easily uh, in a standard way is uh, making uh, things uh, streamlined and much more effective and again it is worth of money <laughs> to do that and and to prepare it uh, in advance because it will ease uh, and, and uh, make fast and all, all the things uh, to everybody so i can just underline it I, I, sorry just to add i think that's that's really interesting that's what i've kind of seen when i've been to conferences in europe recently it's like lots of banks that have now had immense costs of uh, implementing the standards and uh, the regulation and are kind of now looking for the business cases and, and saying like what do we actually now do with it and I think that's that's a really interesting time because everyone is watching each other and seeing like, what, what are others doing how can I now kind of make use of this and it, so it's it's kind of the at the moment in Switzerland I would say it's the other way around um, I'm not saying that's better, but it's it's interesting to kind of compare the two um, situations. Yeah, yeah, definitely, a, definitely a conversation uh, about commercializing open banking as a whole is is a challenge, right? So not only the banks seeing this as a hopefully not seeing this as a regulatory checkbox, which is not open banking is definitely a movement as we move into open finance and open data, but also that the banks realize that this is a, a huge commercial opportunity. It's just a question of finding it. So. Paul, over to you now for, for the next question. Uh, as we look at the changes that banks are going through at the moment to participate in the various um, initiatives like open banking, in your opinion, will they eventually go back to traditional bad behaviors? So uh, it's a really good question, Carlos. And, and I, think the, I think what you call bad behaviors is really a factor of having an unfair position in the market. So, you know, and, and I think open banking really changes that landscape considerably. You know, it makes it much, much harder for any large player just to use their weight to, to push others around. And so I, I don't really see that shift. And I, and I see sort of a systemic, consistent shift in the thinking of the, of the traditional banks that I've talked to uh, about how they want to you know, to change their ways to, to become much more customer focused. And, and also, uh, as Carmela was saying, to look for new opportunities that may not be direct to customer that are about creating ecosystems and participating in ecosystems. And so, uh, I, you know, maybe, maybe we'll get new, uh, new bullies <laughs> who take the market. And, uh, and I am afraid to say, I think in some areas where open banking's not been mandated and is maybe sort of happening through uh through uh, how can i put it through through commercial rather than compliance models 
there may be some companies that sort of try and take the open banking model and, and own it in a way that hasn't really happened in Europe. And, and I think they could become the new, the new big uh, monopolies of the future. But at the moment, I see a, a very strong future, especially in Europe, but in lots of, lots of countries. I've done a lot of work in Africa, uh, in the Middle East, in the Far East, and, and I see some real innovation happening in those spaces. So, so I, think, I think the future is pretty bright. Paul, thank you. And I think what you're saying is, is spot on. And I think by bad behavior, I was trying to, to, be, to say more of the fact of the lack of collaboration, the lack of, of being able to break down some of those procurement walls, et cetera. And you're absolutely right. Um, I, I also uh, have done quite a bit uh, in, and, uh, and traveled quite a bit in Africa and have seen incredible participation and collaboration between banks and fintechs of all sizes. And I think that sometimes we, we look at ourselves as being in, in the large cities and thinking that this is where it all happens and we should follow this model. And I really think that we should learn from other places, not, not only in large cities like London. I, I can see great examples that I've seen in Nigeria and other countries of great collaboration between banks and fintechs that I haven't seen anywhere else. So I think there's, there's lots to learn from that. So yeah, I just um, want to add, I mean, uh, you know, so, so Martin uh, was mentioning he, he's part of the SOCGEN, Society General. They have been working throughout Africa to do some really interesting initiatives uh, with open banking and, and to create uh, mobile apps for, for traditionally unbanked people. And, and I think that's a great example of what, what is an absolutely traditional bank being highly innovative and, and really positive it, it, to, 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 to be honest, to compete with mobile wallets that are springing up. I mean, the average uh, Kenyan probably has three different mobile wallets and, and more money is traded through mobile wallets than traditional banking in Kenya today. So, you know, it's a, it's a interesting challenge and, and I think the world's never going to be quite the same again. No, that's a good point. And, and I think I'll go ahead and, and um, since you mentioned uh, Martin in this case, Martin, would you like to comment on that? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Actually, uh, as the Kenya is the, if I may say, the world leader in, in mobile uh, banking or, or mobile wallets, uh, I think uh, this is uh, something something what, uh, what uh, ha had happened. Uh, but uh, I wanted to mention that uh, there are many uh, examples of applicability of open banking. And uh, one side could be in uh, some developing countries, uh, where is unbanked uh, population, uh, when the traditional banking is not... Uh, uh, either geographically or technologically split it in whole area or whole country, so you can easily put things together, and uh, you can you can uh, let you serve your services uh, to all who who needs it. On the other side, uh, you can as well as uh, touch uh, segments or or clients or or situations uh, where the banking was not present yet and uh, where it is uh, more, more than reasonable and mo more than needed. So uh, open banking could be perceived as well as, as uh, the huge extension of your distribution network. J just imagine situation in connected cars, for example. Everybody is commuting uh, uh, in uh, big cities uh, each day, meaning twice a day, uh, once uh, to work and, and second uh, to your home, and you are alone in your car. And there are plenty of situations uh, when uh, you would like to at least uh, uh, be familiar with uh, what happens uh, uh, on your account, uh, how looks your finances, whether your investments are in a good shape or not, and uh, just combine all these things together, not only with the device, with the environment, just, just the example, the connected cart, or it could be as well a smart fridge in, in your kitchen. Just, uh, just open your, your uh, imagination and uh, combine all, all these things together. L let your fridge to order your meal uh, and check, check the expiration period about the goods in it. So, uh, and all these cases uh, could be combined uh, with uh, open banking. So thank you very much for that, Martin. And I think it makes me very proud, you know, being at the very beginning of, again of what, what's happened with open banking to see countries like Kenya being mentioned and, and, and just seeing so many other countries that we just don't think about as being real innovators. I think that that's, that makes, you know, it should make all of us very proud of, of where open banking has gotten to. But I wanted to give Carmela a fair shot because when we said, you know, will, will banks uh, fall back to bad behavior? Uh, Carmela, what's your opinion on that? Um, 
well, my answer to that, that question is really short. It's no way to come back to bad behaviors. I mean, it's like, um, it's, le it's like if you ask me the question that uh, once credit cards are spread across the world, is there any, any um, opportunity to go back to the past? Which the answer obviously is no. Here, I think it's the same. Once you open the door to open banking, to partnerships, to do things in a different way, there's no way back. Good. Thank you. Um, I remember uh, just a couple of years ago when I was when I first traveling to talk about open banking, a lot of traditional banks uh, literally cut a couple of meetings short and told me to uh, that they were just going to end the meeting right now because they would never participate in open banking and that open banking would eventually just go away. So I just I'd like to remind them of that conversation and, and just say that open banking is very much alive. And here we are ready to help all of us ready to help those banks to uh, to advance in what they're doing. I'm going to go ahead and move on just a bit. Um, Martin, this question is, goes to you. Um, with everything we know now and, and with open banking, will banks disappear as we know them today if they don't adapt to open banking? So if they don't embrace open banking, will they disappear as we know them? Meaning, will we go back to the Bill Gates um, uh, term of, you know, we need banking, we don't need banks? Uh, thank you, Carlos. Uh, actually, my, my personal opinion is not. Uh, and uh, this was really straight answer, but uh, uh, let's go deeper. Uh, just imagine uh, there could be some four basic cases how banks can behave in an uh, actual world uh, where open banking and APIs and fintechs pops up and changes uh, maybe the market uh, as, it were, as, it, as it was. Uh, so uh, the first case is, just to be aligned with all that uh, regulation requirements, at least here in Europe, where at least PSD2 is uh, required by banks, uh, uh, from banks uh, by regulators. Uh, so they, they could be compliant. They can uh, provide their uh, PSD2 APIs and that's it. Uh, on the other hand, uh, just imagine that uh, banks could behave not only as banks in a traditional way to, to provide APIs, but they can behave as uh, TPPs. So they can as well as consume. So they can connect other banks, APIs, and then can combine all that API services and data together with their own. And uh, they can make something up to that uh, for their customers. Third case is just imagine that uh, you can not only provide your own uh, regulated APIs, meaning PSD2 APIs, but you can uh, look uh, forward uh, for some extended uh, cases. You can, you can treat uh, open banking as the traditional product, if I may say. Uh, from the point of view, you are thinking as well as about monetization, about business cases, about uh, client satisfaction, and do that things uh, as well as not only that you have to do, but for some reasonable things. And uh, you, you can get either NPS or you can get uh, from that some money. Uh, and if you combine all that things together on one, uh, one side, you can act as TPP uh, and you can consume. On second side, uh, you can provide something up to that uh, in extension. This is something what I'm calling disruptive. And this is what we are trying to do in KB. Uh, so on one side, act as TPP, combine things from other banks, from non-banking providers, from fintech startups together. Uh, in some reasonable space uh, uh, for a client. And on second side, uh, we are trying to find out some, some other new uh, cases uh, which are reasonable for our clients. And uh, my personal opinion is that uh, this is something that is changing all times. Thanks, Martin. And Julia, I'll give you the first shot at this. Uh, being in Zurich, where you have, you're surrounded by so many traditional banks, uh, you know, uh, from you know, years and years uh, of uh, traditional banking, how do you think will they if, if will they disappear if they don't adapt? Uh, no, I don't think that banks will disappear. I think kind of the 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 banking license itself will still be, be something that has some sort of value and will still be regulated. Now, I don't think that everyone will become a bank, a regulated bank themselves or wants to, because I don't think it's actually fun for everyone to be a regulated bank. So uh, there will, might be many players that really um, on purpose opt to not do that and to work with the bank on uh, to have the, those regulated parts and the, you know, the, the, the reserves and all of that. Um, but I, um, 
I, I mean, I think what, what will become less will be the, the front end. I think banks will lose some of the front end, especially in retail banking. Um, but uh, there will still be many other parts that you can play to power um, the, the financial system in, in, in general. Yeah. Thank you, Julia. I think the one thing that we're probably forgetting is, um, is to talk about the consumer, right? So when we talk about banks disappearing, it's really about the consumers, how the banks reach out to the consumers and make it, make it so that the, bank, the consumer will still want to interact with a bank. And it's so, it's so now where fintechs, big techs, uh, the, the famous um, uh, you know, big uh, fintechs like the Apples and the Googles and whatnot, the GAFAs of this world, whether they will take over that interaction with the consumer and the interaction from, the, from a customer base to a bank will disappear. And that's, I think that's more of that, that issue of whether they adapt to be attractive to the consumer or whether they will disappear uh, because they will lose that, that, um, that, that, that consumer facing uh, capability. Yeah, and um, UX and um, customer engagement is not a strong point of many banks. So I think that um, I think banks can learn a lot from from more uh, big techs and and other startups. Um, and I think there's this that's more of a kind of realizing each other's strength and and using them together to 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 do something better for the customer. And I think it's happening, but it's it's a little bit to go in the mindset of the big banks and there's some of the really big ones here in Switzerland are, are, are definitely not yet there. Thank um, you, Julia. Carmela, I'm going to go ahead and, and move on to you now with the next question. For Europe as well as for Latin, for Latin America, why is it challenging for banks to break from traditional old bank mentality to this new customer-centric model since we were just mentioning customers? Um, well, well I, I would say um, that I mean, at BBVA precisely because we operate globally, we know that there are not two places where financial operations work exactly the same. So we have a global vision, but we have an in-depth understanding of how the local markets work, in which we have been operating for years. Um, and we think our experience is unbeatable, uh, an unbeatable asset in, in advising companies with uh, commercial interests uh, around the world. No? Um, beside that, I think one of the main challenges is the investment uh, both in technology, which is one, and uh, the other one that the, we tend to put in the second place, but is the hardest to change, which is the internal processes, the internal contrast, uh, control, so that we can guarantee that third parties can access their customers' data um, provided by APIs but with the needed security and privacy of uh, the customer's data. Um, and, and all this combined brings into the development arena pieces and processes that were not there before. And I think this is the challenge. This is the, the mindset change that uh, we need to, to keep in mind. No? Uh, in the same way, the banks need to appify all their services as, uh, those little bridges that allow two applications to connect and exchange information. And this is a very different way to approach the traditional services that uh, a bank gives from their own channels to their own customers where security is controlled by your own systems, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, last but not least, we have the cloud, which is a, a window into gaining speed and access to new digital ecosystems. But in some cases, uh, you face uh, with the regulation that you need to take into account, which can be, for example, the case of Turkey. Um, so, I mean, uh, we also need to bear in mind that banking is a highly regulated industry and uh, any change needs to follow a strong compliance program, which again is a challenge uh, to, to, to innovation. No? But um, it also sits at the core of the reliability inherent to, to banks. No? So I think that all these combine, the cloud, the application, the internal processes, the regulation, all, all these bring challenges into the, the open banking world. Thank you, Carmena. And just, I'm going to go ahead and, and just jump back to Paul and, and uh, wrap up with this last question for, for Paul. Uh, open banking has the consumer at the center of the initiative. Do you think that banks understand the threat of big or small techs that are delivering consumer-centric products based on banking and not on the use of actual banks? So it's a really good question, Carlos. And I think that 
when you look at it, they, they do see the threat, obviously. And, and as I said before, you know, we, we worked with, uh, for example, Societe Generale in building a common platform for a single mobile app for multiple countries across Africa. But I, I, I don't believe that, that, that we've really fully understood the, the complete shift in the API world. So, for example, we've worked with a lot of telcos in creating mobile wallets and and we've seen some of those telcos in southeast asia actually apply and get licenses to become banks because they are actually doing more banking than than the banks because in some countries the the number of unbanked is much is very high and everyone has a mobile phone i think the real revolution here is that you know apis are the products of the 21st century and you know, you would have thought that, that banking, which is fundamentally a kind of virtual business, would have understood that, that virtual products are, are, are the future. But actually, I think, I, I think that there's still some learning to be had. And one of the key lessons I think that people haven't yet got their head around is that, you know, there was a big innovation in, in the 20th century around an integrated supply chain for products. So that's what changed products in the 20th century. And if APIs are the products of the 21st century, we need an integrated supply chain for APIs. So that means being able to manage your APIs and, and the, the logistics, the supply, everything from right from the back end, from your legacy systems, through your partners, through your ecosystems, through federation of APIs, and, and to create a, a highly integrated network. And, and I, I see only a few companies really grabbing that. Uh, and I, I'm afraid I think the, the banks haven't quite got there yet. Some of them are, are getting there, but it's, it's not happened yet. Thank you, Paul, very much for that. Unfortunately, we've run out of time. I think we've had even uh, you know, additional questions, and I, I'm sure there were a lot more comments uh, to make, but we have run out of time. So I wanted to, uh, I know we're going to be going into some um, Q&A at, at, uh, later on, but I wanted to thank my panel, first of all, all of you, for just a great insight. Uh, I think uh, we could be talking for hours on this subject. I really wanted to thank everyone for your participation and for your great insight on, on this panel.